Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. As you know, in the early part of 2019, we're going to be taking a look at the role that existing and new technologies can play in mitigating the worst effects of climate change. So this week, we're going to take a look at a technology called direct air capture. Essentially, scientists have shown that our planet is warming more rapidly than standard models suggest it should be. And the only way they can replicate what's actually happening to the planet is to include human carbon dioxide emissions into those models. So it's us, we know that, and it's settled. And the climate projection model is produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, you know, the ones they so helpfully call Representative Concentration Pathways, or RCPs, show a range of severity in temperature increase between now and 2100 as a result of those carbon dioxide emissions. But the models that show the smallest increase, or even a modest decrease, all include some form of negative carbon technology, known as negative emissions technology. In other words, if we're going to achieve those results, or anything like them, it's simply not enough to just reduce the amount of carbon dioxide we're emitting at the moment. And by the way, we're not even doing that. We're going to have to actually start to remove carbon dioxide from our atmosphere and somehow lock it away so that it can't get up into the stratosphere and do its greenhousey thing. Now the option of choice in the IPCC reports tends to be bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration or BECS and that's a technology we've touched on before and something that we'll look at in much more detail in an upcoming program. But direct air capture or DAC can potentially also store CO2 in the earth and it's a technology that's been gaining traction over recent years. So how does that work? Well, it's pretty simple in theory. You just mount loads of massive suction fans into big housing units, each of them about the size of a shipping container. The fans literally suck air in and shove it over a concoction of chemically absorbent substances where a reaction takes place that captures the CO2 and lets the clean air carry on back out into the atmosphere. Once you've done that, you have of course got yourself a shed load of carbon dioxide and a decision that needs to be made about what you're going to do with it. Currently, there's only a very few companies that are developing this technology anywhere in the world. The two front runners are the Swiss firm Climeworks, who we've looked at before, and a company called Carbon Engineering, who are based in British Columbia. Now, it's at this point that an extremely important distinction needs to be made between two forms of this technology. You see, you can either have DAC, which we've just alluded to as direct air capture, or you can have DAX with two C's, which is direct air capture with carbon sequestration. While carbon engineering do allude to both technologies on their website, their commercial strategy appears to be really based on direct air capture of CO2 for their trademarked air to fuel product. Carbon engineering are backed by big money investors, including Bill Gates and Murray Edwards, the billionaire tar sands magnet who runs Canadian Natural Resources Limited. Their technology uses a potassium hydroxide solution which reacts with CO2 to form potassium carbonate. This removes a quantity of CO2 from the air passing over it. The remaining air, now containing less CO2, is released. And then further treatment of the solution separates out the captured CO2. Quoting from their website, air to fuel uses renewable electricity to generate hydrogen from water and then combines it with CO2 captured from the atmosphere to produce hydrocarbon fuels such as diesel, gasoline and jet A. It gives us a way to produce global scale quantities of clean fuels that are compatible with today's transportation infrastructure and engines but that add little or no fossil carbon emissions to the atmosphere. They've been operating a demonstration plant in Squamish, Canada for about three years, which they say is now pulling about a tonne of carbon dioxide a day out of the air. Back in June, they released a paper on their findings to quite some fanfare in the media. Here's Steve Oldham, their chief executive. Who is going to discover enough fuel to transport the world and replace the traditional fuels? That's a really big amount of fuel. Well, we've discovered it. No exploration, no drilling, no oil rigs, no nothing. We've discovered it in every single country in the world. Every jurisdiction, every place. Anywhere can have fuel. What is this discovery? It's right here. It's just air. Sounds too good to be true, right? A very compelling message from a very polished salesman. 
The headline seems to be that the cost of producing a tonne of CO2 from this method has gone down from about $600 back in 2011 to something between $94 and $232 today. If it can operate below $100 a tonne, then it is a viable proposition. So there's very good reason to think that this technology may well contribute towards the displacement of traditional fossil fuels, which is no doubt why Mr. Edwards was so keen to get involved. But what's really important to understand here is that the air to fuel model is not a negative emissions technology. At best, it's carbon neutral because it's basically recycling existing carbon dioxide from the air back into the air as the fuel gets used in vehicles. Now that's definitely an improvement on digging up vast quantities of carbon rich material from the earth and burning that to spew out more and more CO2. But there are some caveats here. Carbon engineering system uses a large quantity of water to provide the hydrogen for their hydrocarbon fuel. That process in itself uses a very large amount of energy. So you have to be absolutely sure that the energy required for that and for powering the DAC system is also carbon neutral, which is to say from genuinely renewable energy sources. And just as with all these new technologies with titles like renewable and sustainable, you do need to also factor in the CO2 emissions and other environmental impacts of the materials and manufacturing process required to get it built and to run it on a day-to-day -day basis. Climeworks also offer their captured CO2 for industry for conversion to carbon neutral fuel, but they seem to place much more emphasis on the DAX option, which means they're focusing on sequestering the CO2 underground wherever possible. The CO2 capture technology is similar to that of carbon engineering, but Climeworks use granules to soak up the CO2 using a module that sits on top of an incineration plant. Then waste heat from the incinerator is used to heat the mixture up to 100 degrees Celsius, which drives the captured CO2 off the granules. And this can then be stored, sequestered or sold for various uses, including carbon neutral fuel. As they point out on their own website, sectors such as shipping and aviation don't yet have viable alternatives to fossil fuels. Traditional mitigation measures such as renewable energies can even in the optimum scenario only reduce CO2 by around 80%. The rest must come from removing carbon from the air. They also provide a useful comparison of their technology with the other major negative emissions technologies, including the BEX technology favoured by the IPCC. You can see that as well as only using a fraction of the land of the other technologies, it also has the significant advantage of zero water requirement, and that'll be a pretty important consideration as our population continues to grow. Climeworks currently have three sites one in their native Switzerland, where CO2 is supplied to local greenhouses to enhance photosynthesis in the growing process. A second site in Italy consists of three DAC collectors that filter up to 150 tonnes of CO2 from ambient air every year. A nearby alkaline electrolyzer generates 240 cubic metres of renewable hydrogen per hour by making use of excess on-site photovoltaic energy. The captured CO2 and renewable hydrogen are then catalytically methanated by a French company called Atmostat and the methane is then liquefied and used to fuel natural gas lorries. Their third site though is in Iceland and it's here that Climeworks are working specifically on the sequestration of CO2 as part of a project called CarbFix2. Here's Jan Wurzbacher, co-founder of Climeworks, talking about how the Iceland plant works. Here in Iceland there are basaltic rock formations and they can very easily store CO2. You can inject CO2, the CO2 reacts with these rock formations and becomes solid carbonate one kilometer underground. If we think of where all the CO2 came from, it came from underground, right? Fossil oil or from fossil gas. We've opened these reservoirs, taking the carbon out and now we are basically putting the carbon back into the ground. We have set our vision to capture 1% of global emissions in 2025 in order to limit global warming to reasonable levels. Now, at this point, I find myself reluctantly straying into political ideology, which is something I've tried to avoid doing on this channel, other than a little bit of gentle derision of the orange incumbent of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, who is, let's face it, a bit of an anomaly. But the point is this, DAC and DAX serve as an interesting analogy for the way that our society will need to strike a balance between capitalism 
and dare I say it, socialism. <laughs> as we career through the 21st century. And here's why. The market-driven strategy of capturing CO2 and converting it into fuel with the very clear and apparently compelling message that it produces carbon neutral fuel for all existing vehicles, as pure as the driven snow, allowing us all to carry on our lifestyle with an entirely clear conscience, is ostensibly perfectly reasonable and rational in the context of our entrenched capitalist system in the West. It's fair to say that the vast majority of technical advances that we enjoy today and that most Westerners would struggle to live without have come about as a result of the competitive urgency that a capitalist market engenders. And in that sense, market-driven competition can be seen as a positive for progress. By contrast, DAX, which is exactly the same technology but with the added step of sequestering the CO2 deep within the earth where it'll be locked away for millennia, has no known commercial application in today's market. So it can and will only happen with state sponsorship or subsidy. That is much closer to the socialist concept of a central power acting as an arbiter over an entire society to ensure that major infrastructure is governed for the benefit of all citizens and not just a privileged few and paid for by all citizens through higher taxes. And that's a concept that a lot of people on both sides of the pond find a bit distasteful. We all know, of course, that the more extreme proponents of each of these philosophies are more or less completely irreconcilable, as is being so ably demonstrated right now, both in the United States and in the United Kingdom. But I would suggest that if our governments don't recognise the need to start capturing and sequestering CO2 immediately in order to achieve the genuine negative emissions that are already factored into all those IPCC climate models, then we will inevitably reach a point where our climate is so out of control that politicians will find themselves with little choice but to implement this and other technologies anyway. And then in such a completely knee-jerk and rapid and draconian manner that the shock to national economies and societies will be so great it may prove to be an even more significant compounding factor in the climate predicament anyway. A little bit of tough medicine now may prevent a major illness further down the line Think of it like a vaccination. As for me, well, there is something slightly unsettlingly ironic about the idea of a multi-billionaire who made his money peddling fossil fuels from arguably the dirtiest and most polluting source of oil known to man, managing to find a way to recoup the CO2 that his fossil fuels produced and then using it to make even more combustible fuels so that he can sell them all back to us a second time. I suspect he can hardly believe his luck. Anyway, I'll let you folks have a think about that one. And as ever, I'll be very interested in your feedback in the comments section below. That's it for this week, though. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And don't forget to hit the like button and the little bell so you get notified when a new program comes out. And you can do all that by clicking here. As always, thank you very much for watching. Have a great week. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.